Well, good morning. It is great to be with you here across time and space to deliver to you God's holy word. Today we'll be reading from Paul's letter to Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 to 14. Uh, Before we read that, let us pause for a moment and turn to the Lord in prayer. Gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here today, Lord, and we thank you today for bringing us your holy word. And Father, we know that we cannot understand the things that you have determined for us without your spirit to illuminate our minds and our hearts and our souls. So Father, I pray that that spirit be with us here now as we read. Lord, help us to understand. Lord, help us to see the truth that you have given to us. Father, bless this holy reading of your holy word, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So our scripture passage, Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 14. Listen now to the word of the Lord. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So how many of you remember this time last year? How many of you remember where you were last New Year's Eve? Or just that Sunday after the New Year began? How many of you remember the plans that you had for last year? How many of you had any idea of what was coming ahead? You know, this week I went back and looked at the sermon that I preached this time last year. Looked at my sermon the first Sunday, the New Year's Sunday of 2020. And I got to tell you, looking over the things that I wrote, I was very, very optimistic about 2020. The sermon was all about starting over in the right way, but how to kick it off and have a great year. Well, we couldn't have known. We couldn't have known what was going to lie ahead. But here's the real gut punch. Even if you had known what was coming ahead in 2020, what could you have done about it? What could anyone of us have done about it? This, This is a thought that really makes you feel like the small human beings that we actually are. Had we known what was coming in 2020, what could we have done about it? I don't know, maybe buy stock in Zoom, maybe buy stock in mask and hand sanitizer, but there's not much else that we could do. These were events far beyond our control, far beyond anybody's control. And when we think about that, it has us wondering, what exactly does 2021 have in store for us? And if we're honest, we got to say there's a lot of us that are a little worried about what's coming next. And I might even say they're afraid of this new year. After all, after all, we do know it could get worse. And I understand this worry. 
I understand the anxiety we face. I share a little bit of it myself with you. But today I want to come and remind you that fear is no way to start the new year. In fact, if we're going to have any hope in starting this new year, any hope in the days and the months that we have ahead of us, the only way to start that out is to start by trusting that God has a plan. That God has a plan and that plan is bigger than anything that 2021 is able to throw at us. Now that's a phrase that Christians toss around quite a bit, isn't it? Trust in God's plan. God has a plan. Well, it's all part of God's plan. Well, you know, this is, after all, God's plan. I think we, we use that phrase a lot and we tend to misunderstand what it means, God's plan. Or what God's plan actually it is. Too often when we talk about God's plan, we talk about it as if everything that happens to us was determined by God. Everything that happens to us was willed by God. And, and a long time ago, God was planning out the universe and he inserted every little event that happens to us in life. So whatever happens, we got to say, well, this is God's plan. I get in a car wreck on the way home today. Well, it must have been God's plan. God must have wanted me to get in this car wreck or I get sick from something. Well, you know, this is God's plan. He must have wanted me to get sick. My kid gets tested positive for COVID-19. Well, I guess God wanted him to. Now, I can't always say that the things that happened aren't determined and planned out exactly that way by God. Maybe God did determine some of these things. And I'm sure there's a lot of these things that happen in our life that God wanted to happen just so. And he determined him by the counsel of his will. But I don't think that is what God's plan is all about. Nor do I believe that that's what Scripture means when it, Scripture talks about living and working in God's plan. The passage I read to you today from Ephesians, this opening chapter of Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, talks a lot about God's plan. Three times in these few verses, Paul mentions providence and predestination, Presbyterian's favorite word. Listen to what it says in verse 4. God chose us in him before the foundation of the earth. So God here, before he made the foundation, before he started the earth, has already chosen us, has already begun to lay a plan out. In verse 5 it says that we have been predestined to adoption to, to, to God through Christ Jesus. Once again, God has his plan. He's predestined it. He already decided what was going to happen. We were going to be adopted to him. And then in verse 11, we have been predestined according to him who works all things according to his will. We have been chosen by God. We have been predestined by God. And that means God has a plan for us. But Ephesians takes it a little bit further and it talks about this plan and it tells us exactly what this plan is that God has for us. Listen to what it says in verse 9. God has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan. You hear that? As a plan. He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So it says there quite explicitly, God has a plan, a plan for the fullness of time. And by fullness of time, he just means a plan for all time. A plan that's going to happen when all time, when it reaches what he says, the fullness, which is reaches the end, the peak, when all time is filled up, when it's all done, this is his plan. It's a plan for the end of time to unite all things in him. God's foreordained plan. And he chose us. He predestined us to be a part of this plan. Now the key part I want you to recognize here is exactly what this plan is. And the plan, as Ephesians tells us, is to unite all things in Christ. To unite all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. And that's all things, everything united in Christ Jesus 
Now you and I, united in Christ, just as we are united here in the church, our divided world around us, all united in Christ, all separation, all division, all warfare and all strife, all these things united in Christ. Paul says all things in heaven and on earth united in Christ. That is everything that exists in the realm of the spirit. Everything that exists in the fleshly realm of the earth. All that is broken. All that is broken in the world healed once again. This is the plan of God. This is what our Lord has predestined for us. This is what He has chosen for us. This is the will of God, what it is working towards through all of history, through the work of His church, through the people of God. And that is what He is working for through our daily lives. Now this plan, this plan of God is bigger than anything that the world can possibly throw at us. This plan is bigger than anything that this year can possibly throw at us. But does this mean that God has planned out every moment of our lives? God has determined what's going to happen of every second of every day that we live. Has God already determined and chosen for us where we're going to live? Has He chosen and determined for us where we're going to work, who we're going to marry, what happens to us? Has has God already chosen for me that today at lunch I'm going to have the turkey instead of the ham sandwich? Maybe some of those things. Maybe some of those things are determined by God, and maybe a lot of what we do has already been determined by God. But I don't think that's what He means by the plan of God. Instead, when we think about the plan of God, we should think about it the same way a coach or a general makes a plan. The way a coach makes a plan for a game coming up or or a general might plan for an upcoming battle. Now, when, when a coach or general makes his plan of action, he doesn't control what the other side does. He doesn't necessarily even control all what is the individual people and his team or his army do. But what they do is they make a plan for what they want to do to counter the enemy. And the plan that the coach or general makes is a plan for victory. It's a plan for an ultimate goal, an ultimate victory to be achieved. And the plan is how this ultimate goal or victory is going to come about. And like I said, they don't determine what the enemy does. They don't control what the other side does. But they've got a plan to counter it. If an enemy attacks with so many troops, then the general has a plan to counterattack with so many of his If the enemy tries to do a maneuver to to flank, then the general will send troops into another place to counter that flank. If the offense lines up with five wide receivers, then the coach has a plan to counter with an extra defensive back. Now, anyone who has watched football, or at least studied football a little bit or studied war a little bit, knows that no plan is perfect. That no plan can counter all the moves of the enemy to make it turn out exactly like you want to. No plan is so good that it basically assures a guaranteed victory no matter what. No plan can do that unless unless God is doing the planning. And I think that is what Scripture means when it talks about the plan of God. And what we should mean when we talk about the plan of God is perfect. It doesn't mean that God has determined all things. It doesn't mean that God tells Satan to go tempt one certain person to go do something evil. It doesn't mean that God willed the Nazis to rise to power and to slaughter millions of people. It doesn't mean that God arranges for serial killers to come up in societies and murder people. It doesn't mean that God causes kids to get sick. It doesn't mean that God created COVID-19. But will all these things work to fulfill his plan? Yes, they will. Because the plan of God is perfect. 
And there's nothing the enemy can do to derail the plan of God. There's nothing the world can do to stop God's plan from coming to fulfillment. There's, even if all the evil people in the world all got together and they determined that what they were going to do was use all their effort and money and resources to stop God's plan, it would not derail it a single second that God has already determined. And it's not because... God determined or wanted these bad things to happen to us in his life. But instead, it is God's plan. It is his battle strategy is so perfect. Nothing can stop it from happening. His plan for you is so perfect that there's nothing this world can do to stop that plan from coming to victory. There's nothing that, that, that the world can do to me that can stop God's plan for me from coming to perfection. It is the plan of God and it will be done. You and I and all of us will be united in Christ along with a redeemed creation. God's plan will see us through all we experience to make sure this happens. Because God's plan is perfect. When I worked at hospice, one of my duties was to make bereavement calls. And this was calling on the families of people who had lost someone in hospice and just checking up with them on a regular basis to see how they're doing and if there's anything we could help through their grief process. I remember once calling this uh, gentleman who had just lost his wife probably about six months earlier. And I called him up, and he had an interesting conversation with him, and he told me a story I'll never forget. When I talked to him and asked him how he was doing, he said he was doing okay, and he, and he missed his wife terribly, though. Her, her name was Michelle. He missed his wife a lot, and he says, you know, something just happened to me recently that you might find interesting. I want to share it with you. He said, a few months ago, I was scheduled to have surgery. And I got to tell you, I'm, I'm petrified of surgery. I've done it a few times, I've never liked it, and the only way I've ever gotten through the surgery is my wife, Michelle, was there to see me through it. Michelle was always my rock, she always gave me the strength to get through, and, and I was coming up to the surgery, I was missing her more than I think I ever have missed her, and I was very afraid for this surgery. And he said, I was praying the night before I went into surgery, and I'll tell you, I prayed something I probably shouldn't have prayed, but I prayed it anyway. As I was praying, I said, Lord, could you please send Michelle to be with me during this surgery? Maybe it's not the right prayer to ask, but Lord, I just really need this for my comfort. Would you please send Michelle to be with me in this surgery? And so the next day he gets up and he is getting ready. He goes into surgery and he's in the hospital and they've laid him out. They've started prepping him and doing all this stuff. And, and he's still very anxious about it as he's telling me this. And he says, at, at, at the height of my anxiety, a nurse comes in. She stands beside me and says, I'm going to be your nurse with you today. And I'll be with you through the whole surgery. And my name is Michelle. And he said, at that moment, I said, let's do it. Let's go. I'm ready. It's going to be okay. Now, we had a few kind of chuckle with God. He says, you know, when I prayed to the Lord, I didn't really mean that, but I guess I didn't specify which Michelle I was talking about when I said, could you send Michelle to be with me? But he did it all the same. And I hear stories like that, and I think, how does God pull something like that off? I mean, how do you really pull something like that off? For how long did he have to be working and moving behind the scenes to answer that prayer? I mean, to try to start thinking about all the moving pieces that he had to arrange to get into place to have Michelle there when this man had prayed for her to be there is beyond comprehension. How do you resist that? How can you, how can you fight that? You, you can't checkmate a God who can do these kind of things. You can't because he's got you beat before you even start. Even before we make a move, he's already planned his counter move. The counter move is actually already happening. It's already, it's already in play before we've even made our first move. You can't checkmate a God like that. 
But Satan can't checkmate him either. The world can't checkmate him either. And 2021 certainly cannot checkmate our God. Because whatever this year has got in store for us, good or evil, God's plan is already in motion to counter it. In Romans 8, Paul tells us that all things work for good for those who love the Lord. All things work for good for those who love the Lord. Now what I love about this verse is it doesn't say that God makes all things happen. It doesn't say that God makes all things feel good for those who love the Lord. He doesn't even say God makes everything good for those who love the Lord. It says that God makes all things work for good for those who love the Lord. Everything that happens in my life, God is going to make it work for good. Everything that's happened in your life and will happen in your life, God is going to make it work for good. All the joyful, positive things that happen, and even all the evil and painful things that happen to us, all of these things are going to work for good. Because God's plan is perfect. He will make them work for good. Looking back at last year and the sermon I preached this time last year, I was indeed very optimistic. I'm not going to apologize for that because this year I'm optimistic too. And I'm not optimistic because I know that this year is going to be a good year. I can't even get up here and say that it will be better than last year. The reason I'm optimistic is because this year, like all the years that came before it, and all the years that will come after it, this year will be the year that we get to see God's plan in action. And let me share something with you, friends. That plan, it will be perfect to god be all the glory forever and ever amen friends will you pray with me blessed are you O lord our god king of the universe lord today we come together with thanksgiving to you lord and thanking you for your perfect plan for us Father, we know when we trust, Lord, we know just deep in our hearts that there's nothing that this world can do to take your plan off the course that you have already set it upon. But Lord, sometimes we doubt. Sometimes we are afraid. Sometimes we see the great power of the world rising up above us. Lord, our fears, they look so big. Lord, they seem to tower over us. Father, we forget about your perfect plan. Father, we let the the fear of the present and the pain of the present drown out that promise that echoes into the depths of our soul. That's your plan for us, Lord. That you make all things work for good. So, Father, my prayer for you, for us today, Lord, is that you give us that faith, that courage, and a trust to believe in your plan. Lord, to know that whatever happens to us in life, Lord, that your plan has got us covered already. That whatever we encounter in life, Lord, your plan has already got a counter ready. And Father, wherever we go, or whatever that we would experience, that you will make it work for good. Father, give us that trust that we can go forth and be your people. Father, we can face this year and every year. That we can face good times and bad times. We can face triumph and tragedy. We can face joy and grief with the same peace that surpasses all understanding. Father, breathe that peace upon us that we might live, Lord, always confident and trusting in your light, in your hope, and in your love. And Father, I pray, Lord, right now that you would hear the cries of all of your people today. Lord, you would hear the silent prayers. Lord, you would hear the loud prayers. Lord, you would hear the prayers that dwell deep in the heart of your people. 
And Father, it is in faith and trust in you that we lift up these prayers in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.